I offer you these words in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So, another year, and here we are again in church for Ash Wednesday. I am grateful to see all of you for your presence this evening, to walk, to begin to walk this journey together, to face fully into our mortality together, into the truth of our lives. Seeing the mark of ashes on you helps me realize how deeply connected we are. And even with those we do not know, when I go into the CVS or the Safeway or make my way about the city on Ash Wednesday and see that mark of ashes upon another's forehead, I'm thankful for that witness that they can't even see themselves. And somehow I feel more than casually connected to that person, that we share something very deep. For tonight we will receive a mark upon our foreheads that tells us much about ourselves and to hear the voice of God. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Sobering words, true words, about the frailty and mortality that marks our shared humanity and that which we like to most of the time keep at arm's length but not tonight, not tonight. You are here just where you ought to be. Against the backdrop of human history, the cosmos and eternity of God, we are given life, but really only for the briefest time. And each morning, that we're given that gift of life as we arise to a new day, there is, in my understanding, a fundamental decision that we make either consciously or unconsciously that rules our lives. One route is this direction. Life is short. Its meaning, the meaning of it, I will determine. My happiness, Pleasure, good, and well-being is paramount, and on my terms. The other route is that life is short. It's a gift from God, and it holds beautiful and wonderful possibilities in living toward the light and love and presence of the one who gives life from the first. There is truth and goodness to be discovered in God and fellow members of the human family. And so I will be attentive, attentive. Ash Wednesday means many things, and one of those is a continual reminder of that ever-present decision in life. I've often wondered why so many people find their way to church on this day, Years ago, when I lived in New York City, I served a church in Midtown Manhattan, and we had three liturgies across the day just like here, but during the day, there would always be someone present at the top of an aisle to give ashes, and there was always a continuous stream of people coming forward. Just down the block, two blocks away in front of 30 Rock, St. Patrick's Cathedral, they were stretched out the door around the corner and all the way over to Madison Avenue, an entire city block, waiting to get in to receive their ashes. 
Is the invitation to observing a Holy Lent so compelling, and why? Do we find some comfort or strength in joining with one another, in acknowledging our humanity, our mortality and sin before God together? Christians have been using the symbol of ashes for a long time. There are many references in the Bible to their use in Judaism. Their power and meaning are ancient as an expression of sorrow, sorrow for our sins, and the mortality which is the reality of our earthly lives. I've been caught up short, had my breath almost taken away on a few occasions in the imposition of ashes once, more than once, but the first time caught me for a great surprise as a young mother came and offered an infant, weeks old, to receive the ashes. Or on those occasions when someone comes forward to receive the ashes and you know they're going through something like a cancer therapy, chemotherapy, radiation, and there they are to receive their ashes. Remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. Ten years ago, this month, I was serving as an army chaplain in Iraq. Those were long days, pretty much 17-hour days, and the word day off was not in the lexicon. It was seven days a week. So when I got back to my can at seven, 11 o'clock every night, I was pretty tired. On this particular night, the night before Ash Wednesday, I heard a knock. So I went to the door, opened it, said, Sergeant Hood, what's up? He said, Chaplain, I heard you were going to be rolling up and down the uh, line of departure tomorrow. These elements of Humvees, four, five, six at a time, would break the wire every day going off on missions. He said, I understand you're going to be going up and down the line all day, to, all morning tomorrow, giving out ashes for Ash Wednesday. I said, I am. He said, well, we just had a change in our mission, and uh, we need to leave at 0430. Could you be out there for us? He said, I'll be there, Sergeant Hood. So, next morning, out there on the line of departure, listen to them go through their pre-mission brief, rules of engagement, all that sort of thing. I said to the Sergeant Hood, just let me know, give me a nod when it's time to do it. He nodded to me. I stepped forward, opened my prayer book, began the liturgy for Ash Wednesday. So I'm going through the liturgy, and next thing I know, Sergeant Hood is sidling up next to me going, Chaplain, you gotta speed this up. <laughs> I, I, let's get to the ashes part. <laughs> and I did. Fast forward, forget the homily, that was gone. But there it was, in the pre-dawn chill in West Baghdad, Camp Liberty, the smell of diesel fuel, Humvees, just running the whole time, headlights going, gathered around with about 35, 40 troops. I was the oldest one there, all of them were under 30, most of them in their early 20s. knowing where they were going, knowing what the nature of this mission was, putting ashes on their foreheads. Remember you are dust. To dust you shall return. It was sobering, sobering, almost beyond belief for me. The ashes also remind us of the hard spiritual work to be done with God's help in Lent by fasting and works of love and reconciliation. We're called to be faithful and attentive to the one who loves us beyond measure, the one who was lifted high upon the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself. Yes, this mark of Ash Wednesday can take us many places. I think of it as a time for the faithful to look within and get honest about ourselves and how we have turned from God in a thousand different ways. I think Ash Wednesday can also be a point of entry for a new believer, a seeker. Ashes to go are happening across this city. People are caught up short. It's an invitation to begin a journey. 
which we're more than happy to tell them about. I think it can be a point of entry, especially for someone who's carrying huge burdens through life, racked by pain, or crushing guilt, or feeling lost in life, and who desires a meaning and a connection to truth and goodness and to a life that is imperishable. I read an article in the New York Times some years ago by Neela Banerjee, and it was about the whole area of making confession with an ancient custom carried into a very new way. The article was entitled, Intimate Confessions Pour Out on a Church's Website. An evangelical church sort of co-located a network in nine different places they were offered the opportunity to make confessions online anonymously. The Reverend Craig Greshel said that after 16 years in the ministry, he knew that the smiles and eager handshakes that greeted him each week often masked a lot of pain, but the accounts of anguish and guilt had stunned him and affirmed his belief in the need for confession. Hundreds and hundreds, thousands of hits came in. We know about confession in the Episcopal Church. We have a general confession on Sundays, but we have the opportunity if we want to make a sacramental confession privately with an inviolable trust and confidentiality. It's right in our prayer book probably one of the most important but underused parts of our prayer book. And it may not be for you, but someday it might be. We have guidance for this. Who should do a private confession? All may. None must. Some should. I have. And I can speak to the power of God working through this sacrament of reconciliation. It really does convey God's love and mercy. About 15, now, now it's about 20, 18 years ago, my daughter, Margaret Grace, looked at my forehead on an Ash Wednesday and said, Daddy, what's that? I said, what do you think it is? Is it blood? That was sort of the word that covered any injury. No, it's ashes, I said. So as I gathered some things together to return to the office, she looked out the rectory window and saw the parish administrator closing up the church. And she excitedly ran to me and said, I just saw Mr. Glenn outside and he has a shadow too. He has what? I asked. He has a shadow right here, just like you. I went back to my office, and I wrote that down on a piece of paper, Ash Wednesday, dash, shadows. There's a connection, the shadow side of our lives, being that of which we're afraid, ashamed, or overwhelmed in pain or sorrow, where we have long buried memories of thoughts and actions that we want to hide from ourselves and God and anyone else who might learn of them. Too many people spend enormous energies keeping these places dark in the shadows and away from view. Or that shadow can be the voice or voices we hear that tell us why we're not really lovable. Sometimes we think that it is completely obvious to everyone. We become quite adept at guarding that secret that if people really knew who I am, well, they'd find it hard to love me. And that voice comes from as many places and in as many forms as there are human beings. Everyone knows something, sometime, of what I'm speaking. And this God wants to turn around in Lent. God wants us not to hear these voices, but rather to hear his voice. Now, here is something I knew, 
but I still had to learn and deeply in more recent years that God is already in those dark places those dark and shadowy places of life and waits for us to encounter him there to hear his voice to see his heart to turn to receive his love to receive that love just like one little girl named Mary Ann did many years ago. And this is Mary Ann's story. She writes, I grew up knowing I was different and I hated it. I was born with a cleft palate and when I started school, my classmates made it clear to me how I must look to others. A little girl with a misshapen lip crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and garbled speech. When my schoolmates would ask, what happened to your lip? I would tell them I'd fallen and cut it on a piece of glass. Somehow it seemed more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to have been born different, born this way. I was convinced that no one outside my family could really love me. However, a teacher in the second grade we all adored, Mrs. Leonard. She was short, round, happy, sparkling lady. Annually, we would have a hearing test. I was virtually deaf in one ear, but when I had taken the test in past years, I discovered that if I did not press my hand as tightly upon my ears as I was instructed to do, I could pass the test. Mrs. Leonard gave the test to everyone in class, and finally it was my turn. I knew from past years that as we stood against the door and covered one ear, the teacher sitting at her desk would whisper something, and we would have to repeat it to her. Things like, the sky is blue, or do you have new shoes? And now all was quiet. I stood perfectly still and waited for those words. And then Mrs. Leonard began speaking words which God must have given to her. Those seven words that changed my life. Mrs. Leonard said in her whisper, I wish you were my little girl. Like Mary Ann, we too are summoned every year on this evening, on this day, for a hearing test. Tonight, we receive the mark of ashes, as we do every year, accompanied by the words, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. With them, God tells us something about ourselves, something important ab about our frailty and mortality. But it's not God's last word. That's because there's another mark which we receive. In the same place you receive the ashes, but only once for all time. And it's accompanied by the same voice, different words, the most important words we can ever know. It's a voice which wants to reach us in and through this season of Lent and every day of our lives. It's the voice of God who speaks to us saying, you are my child and you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. To come to know and believe this truth more deeply now that's what this journey is all about, that we begin this night from ashes to Easter. And it begins tonight as we turn towards the good Lord, 
who has brought us to this place and this very important time. In the name of the Father, 